So I hope you can all yes, see you me, and I would ask you if you would mute your microphone so that everybody else can hear what we should say, and there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. So today is all about managing your journey, and I call it a journey because it's not a static thing. Your career will move, your career will evolve, and your career will change. So it is my journey for many years to come. Yeah. And like all journeys, you would really like to be in the diving seat. You would like to be the one in control of where your career is going. So this morning I'm going to talk a little bit about things that you can do in order to take control of your career journey, which hopefully will result in you really enjoying it and ending up where you want to be, which is what all journeys should do. So what we're going to talk about today is your career as a journey and how you can manage it, which will include making decisions, making the right decisions for you, how to find opportunities, what to do with the employer they're looking for, how to make your CV and application stand out, how to manage interviews, which of course everybody is scared of, not, including me, I would say, and looking all the way through as your development as a professional, which is so important. And then finally, I'm going to say a little bit about the support that you can get from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, there is a lot of information online, even if you're not a member, and if you are a member, there are even more services that you can take advantage of. Successful careers don't happen by accident. And if you start thinking about it now and really thinking about what you want to get out of your career, as well as what you want in your career, you can reap the rewards throughout your working life, which is what we all want. After all, we spend so many of our waking hours at work that you really need to enjoy what you do, you need to feel motivated and fulfilled. And if you take on board what we're going to talk about today, there's more of a chance that you will do. And here's another story. You could be planning, if you're right at the very beginning of your career now, you could be planning for the next 50 years, which is quite a scary thought. So you don't want things to take you by surprise. You don't want just to drift from one place to another. You really want to know what your skills are, who is going to want those skills, and where you're going to really enjoy using those skills as well. And um, another thing to think about is that careers really aren't linear anymore. Um, once upon a time, certainly in the UK and in Europe, uh, you might go to work at a very young age for a big chemical company and you would work there for the rest of your career and then retire. But those things don't happen. Uh, we all see smaller companies um, being very prevalent these days rather than the larger companies. And you might have to change careers several times during your career. So learning to be flexible, thinking about how you're going to be agile enough to take advantage of all the opportunities that come your way, and developing resilience too. Uh, so if things don't quite go the way you planned, it won't throw you off track completely. You will find another route around if we're talking about your journey, and it won't have a long-lasting effect on you. So thinking about yourself and how you're going to develop those three qualities are very, very important right at the very beginning of your career. And I think it's very important to understand that your career shouldn't just be your job. It shouldn't be just a succession of one job after another. Um, your career, think of it as a lifelong learning journey. You will learn something new every day. And if you start making your map now, it will help you to find the right turns to take, find the right route through, so that you really enjoy the journey from beginning to end. There will be side posts along the way. There are um, services out there to help you. There are professional bodies such as the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, if you're a member, you can contact us at any time and I will tell you how to do that later in your talk. Um, there might be other professional bodies that you belong to in India or all around the world. Find out what they can offer you. Find out what career support they offer. 
and certainly take advantage of it. If you are still at university, um, there will be career services at your university that you can take advantage of and I really would encourage you to, to do that. Um, some of you might be interested in having career coaches, mentors at some point. Again, if you're a member of the RSC, we do have a mentoring scheme and you can take advantage of that. So, you know, I'll give you some web links to that later on in the talk. But really, really, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, I'm sure it's the same in India as it is in Europe. There is very, very little provision for people with the kind of qualifications that you are going to have or already have. There's very little provision for my so it's even more important for you to take um, to take control of it um, as soon as you possibly can. And when I say take control, um, I think people get very externally focused. They think about employers, they think about CVs, they think about getting their sense of purpose perfect. All of those things are very important, of course. But making a success of this journey really, really stands for you. So take some time to think about yourself what your skills are and what you want will really get you started. And here are some questions to ask yourself. Do you actually enjoy doing? Some of you would enjoy the science, you'll enjoy being in the lab, others of you will enjoy really practical problems to solve. You know, um, there are all sorts of people in the world and there is a place for all of us. And you understanding yourself and knowing how to play to your strengths is very important. So usually we are best at doing the things that we enjoy. So you can start just by thinking and noting down somewhere what you enjoy in all of your life, you know, your professional life and your social and family life too. And what motivates you? What makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? Some people um, want to do work that will benefit the whole of mankind, particularly in this current difficult situation we find ourselves in. Others of you might think you want to do something really important for the environment. You will all want to earn a decent salary and have a good standing in terms perfectly normal things. So think about what it is that motivates you the most and what success would look like for you. Again, that's different for everybody. Um, some people would want would see success in material terms, in terms of you know what they can buy, the house that they live in, all of those sorts of things. That's absolutely fine. Other people would find would think success would look more like what they're able to give to society. You know, like I said, there are many different people in this world. It's understanding what. It really doesn't matter. It's you understanding what's going to work for you and playing to your strengths that's really important. So it might be at the moment that you're facing your first big decision. Uh, it might be that you are studying at the moment and you are thinking, well, what would I like to do? Uh, would I like to stay in academia? Do I want to move into industry? If you are still studying, I think it's so important to think about that now. Don't leave it to the last moment. Both of the network. Uh, Apply 
that there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of other people would have applied to. And there's nothing to distinguish you from those other people. So thinking about how you can use your networks now, how you can build those networks through your university. There are lots and lots of ways that you can start reaching out to people now so that you become more than just a CV to them. You are a real person. And that always happens. There are recruitment agencies who can help you, um, and there is also social media. You can look at companies that you're interested in, you can look at research groups that you're interested in. They will be on social media, they will be on LinkedIn, they will be on Twitter. Take just a little time each week to do some research, and it will really pay off in the long term when you, want, when you come to look for a job for real. I talked about looking at job adverts. Um, here are some jobs. Here are some job websites. Um, of course, some of them are a bit UK centric. I apologise for that. Some of them go across the world. But what I would say is that job adverts, even if you're not looking for a job at the moment, are a great source of information about what. The more people will approach you with, with um, you know, offers and suggestions and opportunities. So raising your profile any way that you can by going. I know we can't go to conferences and seminars at the moment in person, but if you can give presentations online, if you can present posters online, just get yourself out there and make sure that you are networking beyond your immediate university. So that people know that you're there. Obviously, your publication record is very important, so make sure that's all up to date. Uh, build your network, it's so, so important. And as you are researching at the moment, clearly you have very strong research skills. So my advice would be to treat your career development as a research project. What would you need to do? You need to find information, you, you need to talk to people, you need to make connections, you need to find out what other people have done. All of these things are so important. So if you treat your career development as your own research project, that might help you to get yourself organized. Again, if you're looking at the industrial option, um, it's so important to research companies and jobs. We've talked about how you can do that. You can use social media, you can use your network. Just look, even if it's a while until you graduate, you think, I don't need to look at any of that now. I would say you really do. And you can just spend an hour a week Looking, following companies on the internet, looking at job adverts, seeing what those employers want, and get a better idea of where your opportunities might come from. Then you can start building a network in that direction, um, try to find other people who work in those places or have connections with those places, find out more about what they do. It's all really important stuff. Just an hour a week will get you in a much better position. And you can use the time while you're stuck if you still are, to develop workplace skills. So if you're doing your PhD or your undergrad at the moment, find time to do other things as well. Um, you know, offer to get involved with university societies to show that you can work in a team. Um, make sure that you always deliver to deadlines. These are all great things that you can put on a CV, put on your statement of purpose when it comes to apply uh, for a job for real. I know you're all really, really busy with your study, but make a little bit of time to do other things to develop those workplace skills as well, which is what we're going to come on to talk to about now in terms of what employers are looking for. It's so important to understand. Um, lots of people that I speak to in my role as a career and professional development advisor seem to think that their science is going to be all they need. You know, if they have an excellent undergrad, if they have an excellent PhD, that will guarantee them a job. I can tell you now that that is really, really not true. Um, when you graduate, I say congratulations already, I'm sure you all will and you'll do really well. And don't rely just on your science to get you the opportunities that you want. It's not enough. 
Um, this was a quote that I heard actually from somebody pretty high up in Dow, the Dow Chemical Company, actually said this to me personally, that as far as industry is concerned, your qualifications are really just regarded as your ticket in. So in other words, you wouldn't get in without them. But then after that, how you're selected, how your career progresses, depends on all the other skills that you bring, such as team working, um, time management, being able to work independently when necessary, all of those sorts of things, and your attitude. So in other words, it's not what you, not only what you do, it's also how you do it. So I'm going to show you a couple of um, job adverts now. I don't expect you to read everything that's on the that's on the screen, but it just does illustrate the point I'm making. Now, this first is um, a, a, an advert for academia. Please don't try and read all those words. There are far too many of them there. Lots. That's all talking about the technical skills that this particular post is looking for. But in the same academic advert, here I do want you to read what I've put in uh, bold type and underlined because these are the other skills that you would need to demonstrate if you applied for that academic role. So they're talking about someone who can deliver to deadlines, someone who can keep reliable records, somebody who's motivated, enthusiastic and an organised self-starter. Now that's nothing to do with chemistry and everything to do with your attitude. So start thinking how you can build up um, examples of when you've demonstrated these skills um, because they will be so important to you when you come to apply for a role and this is an academic advert too. Um, I just share this with you. This is the UK Research Council Joint Skills Statement so it applies to the UK but I think it's a really good guideline and a good framework to show you what academic careers are based on nowadays. These are the sorts of skills that the UK Research Councils recommend that you develop during your, your, your study. So that's self-awareness, research skills and techniques, research management, personal effectiveness, communication skills, networking and team working and career management. So they're expecting you to do this and they're expecting you to prove this by giving them examples. And UK Research Council is recommending 10 days a year to develop these skills and that they should be recorded as your professional development. So think about that. It's a really good idea. There's some great things there. And if you're looking for a career in academia, I would say that's well worth taking. Okay, we're going to look at an industry, um, an industry advert. Now, industry is even keener on your transferable skills than academia is. Okay. Um, here, this is a typical kind of advert that you can see. They want the degree at the top for an equivalent qualification in chemistry. They're talking about analytical and purification right at the bottom there. But the most important things they're looking for at the top of that advert are a can-do approach, attention to detail, ability to adapt to changing demands, the ability to work in a team and solve problems, confidence, contributing your own ideas. These are all things that you need to give evidence that you can do. So start thinking about what you can do while you're studying to develop some of these skills. So it might be voluntary work that you do, could be taking on responsibility in your research group to do something. You know, all of this is really great stuff that you can put in applications when you finish. So to, to, to round that up, really, it's what's going to be important to you is going to be your science and your skills. Okay, And those kind of skills that we know employers are looking for are definitely teamwork, motivation, enthusiasm, drive, interpersonal and communication skills and commercial awareness as well if you go if you want to go into the industry sector so if we move on um, for either sector whether it's academia or industry you really need to think carefully about what's special about you uh, why would an employer want to employ you over and above all the other people that are going to apply for that job so think about what you have to offer as a person how you can stand out from the crowd and how you can persuade employers that you're the best person for the job. So we're going to move on now to CVs and applications and this brings in, um, I'm going to show you now how you can um, demonstrate some of those skills in your applications. Um, it's very important to say that all CVs and applications, personal statements, statements of purpose, whatever you call them, must be tailored each time you make an application. 
So just having a generic CV is not going to be good enough. Employers these days want to see a CV that's been written for them, for their job, and really shows your commitment and shows that you really want to do that job. Use all the information that's provided by the employer. When you make your application, use their language back to them. Talk about the things that they're talking about. Give examples of the things they're asking for. And follow all the employer's instructions. At that stage, they've got the job and you want it. So playing by their rules is so important. But don't be afraid to be assertive about what you can offer. Um, none of us like talking about ourselves. It's, it, it's not an easy thing for any of us to do. But that employer wants to see that you're the right person for the job. And if you know you have those skills, make sure that they can see that clearly. People do worry about the difference between their CV and their covering letter or statement of purpose, whatever you like to call it. I think a good way to think of it is that your CV should be your what. So your CV is all the factual information. It's what qualifications you've got, what experience that you've got of technical things that that employer is asking for, and also the transfer of skills. What evidence is there that you can work in a team so it's all of that evidence okay now your letter or statement of purpose should complement your cv by being its purpose is to be your why so in other words it shouldn't repeat huge chunks of your cv it should tell that employer why you're applying for that job why that science fascinates you, why that company or why that university or research group interests you, uh, why you're the right person for the job, why you can make an impact. And then the two of those things, the CV and the letter or statement of purpose, together very well. And the employer has a really good idea of what they will get by employing you, which is what you want. That will make your application stand out. If it's nicely tailored, if it shows you've understood what they're looking for, that's exactly the kind of thing uh, that they're expecting to see and that will make your CV and your application stand out. For academic CVs, really, there's no set length. Um, they can be longer than industrial CVs, but that doesn't mean to say that they can be like a small book or a publication. They should be concise and they should be tailored to the specific role that you're applying for. And the kind of things that are important to have included in an academic CV are your research interests, your publications, um, conferences that you've attended and presentations that you've given at those conferences, posters you've presented, um, any awards that you've been granted, um, collaborations that you've been involved in, and also any funding that you've been awarded for your research as well. All of those things um, should be very clearly laid out, as well as the other transfer that that particular institution is asking for. Industrial CVs are slightly different. Um, well, they're quite a lot different in actual fact. Um, they should be a maximum of two pages long. So here they should be tailored very, very closely to the employer's requirements and they should be a mixture of your technical and transferable skills, um, really driven by what's in the advert, what's in the job description. You don't have to include everything, you don't have to include all your publications, you don't have to include your school education very often, you know, they are quite different and need to be more concise than um, that, 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 that a, an academic CV and the rule of thumb really is that the first page of your CV should grab that reader's attention in no more than about 15 seconds because that's all you'll get um, you know if it's being handled by a recruitment agency or if it's an HR or personnel person who is reading that CV first off um, they will be looking for keywords so my advice would be if you're applying to an advertised vacancy print off the advert be really old school get a highlighter pen and highlight the skills that that employer is looking for and build your first page of your cv around that so that very quickly they can see you're a good match for what they're asking for and they might think that you will be a good person to take forward to the next stage which will be an interview it's important to understand um, that your cv the purpose of your cv is to get you an interview not to get you the job um, so you don't have have to tell them everything you just have to let them know that you match as many of their requirements as possible and then i hope you would be invited for interview one thing i would say is please don't be put off if you can't match their requirements 100 
um, when employers write these um, job descriptions and write these adverts they are writing them for a person who does not exist nobody can have all the skills that they're looking for and if you had all of those skills and all of that experience well why would you apply for that job anyway it's nothing new so what i would say is if you can match 75 percent of what they're asking for and you're really enthusiastic about that job okay it's worth it's worth a, it, it's worth trying it's definitely worth an application but make sure that your enthusiasm particularly in your letter or statement of purpose comes across really well um, one of my colleagues in our team at the rsc um, she comes from a recruitment background um, as you know i'm a scientist but my colleague comes from a recruitment background and she says that you can't you can't fake enthusiasm um, you can't pretend to be enthusiastic or it comes across in somebody's application if they really really want the job and they're very enthusiastic so don't, don't be afraid to sound enthusiastic when you're applying um, it really will go in your favor so if you've made good applications and you're applying for the right kind of job tailoring your cv really making it stand out the next um, the, the next stage is usually to be invited for an interview and of course at that point everybody gets very nervous it's worth saying that even though um, i've had an awful lot of interviews during my very long career I'm, I'm quite an old lady now i would still be very very nervous if i had to go for an interview tomorrow it would not change so if you do feel nervous if you do feel self-conscious then please please don't feel that you're alone um, everybody feels the same way it's not a nice feeling but when you're nervous think of this nervousness creates an energy doesn't it so i would say use that energy for positive purposes okay the energy is there you can use that energy to give a really good performance rather than letting get very nervous and shake and um, you know all the other things that we do um, when that energy is going to negative purposes so harness that energy and use it positively we're talking about academic interviews. Um, academic interviews will probably very much concentrate on your academic record, um, your research interests and the chemistry itself. You know, you might very well, you, know, you will get asked about the research that you've done to date. You might get a lot of technical questions about the chemistry, so you have to expect that. But you will also have to expect some questions about your approach to your work. Um, you know, we saw that academic advert. They were very much looking at transferable skills about self-motivation, um, presentation skills, you know, all of that kind of thing is so important. So don't think that just talking about the chemistry will make you successful. You will need to prepare some answers about not only what you do, but how you do it. So think about some times that you took responsibility for something, that you did something in a different way, that you showed um, you, that you can influence other people positively. All of those things are so important nowadays. Industrial interviews, um, it's worth talking a little bit about of these because all over the world really it's the global thing that industrial interviews generally are, are now based on a, a competency model and employers are giving equal weight to your knowledge, so that's what you know, that's your degree, that's the chemistry, of course that's important, you won't get very far without that. But they are also looking for your skills, so that might be instrumentation that you can use, reactions that you're familiar with, all of these sorts of things, and you'd expect that. But also they're looking for your attitudes and behaviours, that's the third area of competency. And people who have up to date been in an academic environment very often ignore those industry requirements altogether and then wonder why they don't get um, wonder why they don't get invited um, for interviews or don't get job offers you know if your attitudes and behaviors are very very much a part of what you should be thinking about so you're likely to be asked about oh i've just had something my screen, I just need to go. Thank you. Right, okay. So you're likely to be asked to describe situations when you've demonstrated certain skills and even hypothetical questions where they know you won't really know the answer, but they're looking at how you approach your work and what you will do in a certain situation. And it's worthwhile saying that, you know, industrial um, employers will almost take your chemistry for granted. They will know that you wouldn't have the qualifications that you've got if you couldn't do the chemistry. But they want to know, will this person fit in with my team? Will this person deliver the results that I want? And they're very, very interested in that. 
that. So they're likely to ask you just, you know, they're likely to ask you questions such as tell us about a time when you faced a difficult situation, tell us about a time when you didn't succeed at something. And on the face of it, these questions can seem quite negative. But prepare some answers for that kind of question. <laughs> So important. Um, choose, um, you know, look, prepare some positive answers about when things did work well for you and be prepared to talk about that. And when you do, make sure that you're talking about your role in that situation. So don't talk about the team did this and the team did that. At that point, they're really interested to know what you did in that situation. So the team might have been given a task, but they want to know what your role in that situation was. So don't be afraid to talk about things that you did well. That's what they're expecting to, to hear. If they're asking you questions which on the face of it seem negative, like tell us about a time when you were involved in something that didn't work, um, prepare some of those questions. Think about something that maybe um, didn't go quite right for you in the past, maybe because you just didn't have enough experience. Be prepared to talk about that, but be prepared to talk about what you did so that in the future, if you were faced with that situation again, you would you would do better. So it might be that you reflected on your own performance. It might be that you talked to more experienced colleagues. It might be that you read a book or, you know, all of these things show that you're the kind of person that takes responsibility for their own learning. Um, and, and the employer could, could uh, rely on you to do that in that situation. And something goes wrong for everybody. And if you answer that question by saying, well, nothing's ever gone wrong for me, believe me, they will not believe you. You know, They want you to show that self-awareness and to show that you can cope with a situation like that and do really well as a result of it. Sorry, I'm going to have to take a drink of water here. But yes, they might ask you technical questions. Sometimes you have two interviews. Sometimes you have a technical interview, but you will, for industry, you will you, you will definitely face these kinds of questions. So I'm going to show you uh, my favorite model here for preparing and answering these kinds of questions. And it's called the STAR model. And what we're hoping is that if you adopt this, you will be a star in your interview and they will offer you the job. So competency based questions very often start tell us about a time when you did this or did that or something went wrong or something went right or you had to deal with a difficult situation. You can prepare answers to questions like this and think about this model to do it. The S in star is the situation. The first thing you need to do is to set the context what was happening, who were you working with, where did the situation come from, make sure that the people listening to you really understand the situation that you were in at the time. The T is for task, so what was required of you, this might have been something that you were asked or requested to do or something that you decided you had to do to put a difficult situation right. Either of those are fine, but make sure that, again, you're talking about what your role was here. You're not talking about the team, you're talking about what was required of you. The A here in STAR is for action, what you actually did. It's all very well thinking about what you needed to do, but did you actually do it and how did you do it? Did you involve other people? Did you have to influence other people? Did you have to change your ideas and do things in a different way? They're really interested in this, um, you know, really personal side of this story. So what did you actually do? And the result, that's the R in STAR, what was the outcome? Now, if it's a positive question about, tell us about a time when you delivered a project on time, the outcome is going to be a good one. You can talk about, um, you know, what you achieved, how it helped your university, how it helped your colleagues, all of that sort of thing. Um, that's fine. If it's, if it's a negative thing that they're asking about, tell us about a time when something didn't work, it might be that the result wasn't what you originally anticipated. The result was something different. But do try to give a result to show that something came out of this situation um, and that you did achieve something. And then that's your star, S, T, A and R. And then the very, the most important thing to talk about at the end of that when you've been through your star is to talk about what you learned from it, to show that you are the kind of person that 
good or bad, you learn from a situation, you adapt yourself next time, you're continuously evolving this journey thing again, you're constantly learning new skills, which you can learn to the workplace. So think about STAR when you're preparing for interviews and keep STAR in your head when you're answering that kind of, kind of difficult question. I hope that will help you. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit now about your own personal and professional development and how that could be the key to your own success. Uh, I think it's really important to um, always understand where you are in your career and always know that it's doing the right thing for you. Be confident about your strengths, build your strengths, build your skills, uh, record them and log them so that you know what you're good at. You know um, when you've done a good job and you know when you've had some success, record it somewhere. Pull it apart, think about the skills that you were using to achieve that success and they are all part of your personal and professional development. One thing I can't stress enough is do think about building your network. Your network really could be the key to your success in future. And I know a lot of people will say, well, I don't have time to network. I don't like networking. Um, I don't like talking about myself. It's so important that you develop a professional network right from the very beginning of your career. Think about who you might meet along your career journey. Um, think about how you can help them and how they may be able to help you. Um, it's not necessarily, if somebody helps you, you may not be able to help them, but you may be able to help somebody else in the future. So that's how networking works. It's a, a circular thing, you know, it's a cycle. It goes round and round. And the more you put into your network and the more you put into your contacts, the more you're likely to get out of them. Now, if you're a member of the Royal Society of Chemistry, we've got lots of members in India. You know, I would encourage you to engage with the local sections to engage with your local networks. It's so important that you become a real person to other people. And you will be able to join groups. We've got divisions and interest groups that you can join online. Um, clearly, nobody is doing any, any um, physical events at the moment, but lots of our divisions and interest groups are doing things online. They are having um, seminars, webinars, things like that, things that you can engage with. So I would encourage you to see um, what's going on there. If you're not a member of the R see look at your university network see what you can get involved in remotely um, or online you know it's great that we've got this whole training program this summer that's a great professional development thing so um here we are this is just where you can network we've mentioned professional organizations university networks conferences, seminars and events, all online at the moment, but do get involved in them. And don't neglect the online, the social media networking, you know, through LinkedIn, ResearchGate, Twitter, by RSC if you're an RSC member. There's lots of things that you can be doing there to get your name out there, to get people to recognize you and to find out what other people are doing too. Don't neglect your family and friends and social contacts. They're very important networking contacts too. And any voluntary work or outreach work that you do all helps to build your network. So get involved in as many things as you possibly can and it will pay off. You never know where the opportunities are going to come from, but the better connected you are, the more likely you are to find out about them. And I think really um, it, it's not a negative thing to think a negative thing to think about where the barriers to your success might be. If you ignore them, um, they're likely to, to, to be very large barriers if they're unexpected and you may not be able to get around them or get over them. So I would say try to anticipate your next career, career move all the way through your career journey. Don't just think about the next step that you want to take. Think about the step beyond that and the skills that you need to develop to make your career run as a smooth journey. You don't want to meet any of those stop signs in the road that you can see on the screen there. So ask yourself, you know, are there any obstacles? Path and be realistic about it. Um, I've, I've mentioned the benefits of being optimistic. Of course, we should all be optimistic, but be realistic too and think, okay, I'm looking at job adverts for the kind of job that I want to do, but I can see they all want better presentation skills than I've got. That would be an obstacle, wouldn't it? So at that point, think about, can you get over them? Could you learn to do presentations better? And if the answer is yes, you know, how can you do that? And that might be by getting involved in some outreach opportunities. It might be doing some presentations online at the moment. Anything that will help you to build up that skill that will enable you to get that job when the time comes. 
and also in, I mentioned this slightly before, but I will come back to it now. Um, collecting evidence of your skills is so important too. Um, if you're an RSC member, there's a link on the screen there that you can use to get into our online professional development recording system. It's a little bit clunky and a little bit old fashioned at the moment. We're currently reviving it and it will look much better next year. But for the time being, it does work. I've been inspired by what we've been talking about today. You can use that to record your own professional development and set yourself objectives, the things that you know that you need to do on a personal level that will enhance your employment prospects in the end. And of course, if you're a, a member of the RSC, you can demonstrate your skills uh, by looking at a professional recognition award. Um, Chartered Chemist is for more experienced people, but you can look for um, all sorts of other things. We have registered scientists and all of that sort of thing. So I would encourage you. I'm sure there are things about equivalent things available in India too. So all of these things help to um, really show your professionalism. It's evidence to other people that you are a professional. And of course, they look great on a CV. They look great in an application and they might set you apart from the competition. So just to summarise really, uh, my last message is, we're going back to this journey again, it's your career, it's all your, it's your, your journey, so therefore it's your responsibility, you can't expect other people to do this for you. So there's a few little hints and tips on the screen here, um, I would say regardless of where you are in your career, now and in the future, always know uh, why you're doing the job that you're doing, what's it doing for you? What skills are you developing? How is it helping you to, uh, to, to grow as a professional? And also know what you're worth outside your current role. So you might be very, very happy in your job. You might absolutely love it. I hope you do. But don't become too, um, don't, don't get too inside that to, 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 the, um, to the exclusion of looking around, looking at the environment, seeing what other jobs are out there and where your next opportunity might come from. You don't have to act on it if you're very, very happy in your job, very happy with your company and they're treating you well, that's fantastic. But unexpected things can happen. Whoever could have predicted this awful situation that we're in at the moment, it will change life for a lot of people. So always know what you're worth outside your current role, who else might want to employ you and be developing the kind of skills that would um, look impressive um, to them. Um, you can do that by making career research part of your monthly routine, set aside some professional development time for yourself, say once a month, where you shut the world out and you just focus on yourself and think, how am I doing? What have I done that's been new this month? Uh, what skills have I learned? Where were my successes? What didn't go quite so well? Reflect on all of those things um, and also take that time to keep your network up to date as well. Who have I met? Can I connect with them in some way? Can I send them a, a web link or something that might help them so they remember me? You know, all of these things, they take a little bit of time, but it's time that you're investing in your future, which is going to be great. And always know and understand what skills that you need to develop in your current role that will take you to the next. You know, don't wait until the time that you want to make a move to, 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 to understand what it, what skills you, you, you need to do that. You know, look at look at roles that are too advanced for you at the moment, look at job descriptions for them and think, okay, um, I'm going to have to develop this skill and that skill, so what can I do to start on that path now? Do something positive about developing those skills and that kind of positive attitude it will be will really stand you in good stead and like I said plan and record your professional development as you go along and then you've got lots and lots of examples there for interviews for for CVs and applications too it takes the hard work out of it so just to summarize then um, you know your career journey is your personal journey but a proactive and managed approach will reduce the chances of you ending up here at a, at a block across the road where you can't get any further because nobody wants that with the amount of work you've put into getting your qualifications so far you should be looking forward to a really um, exciting future before I finish completely, I just want to draw your attention to another program that the Royal Society of Chemistry um, runs. If you are currently a PhD student or postdoc and you're looking for a career in academia, I would point you towards our Jolly O'Curie program. There's some details about it on the screen there. Um, it's, a, it, it, it's a program that we run every year. We do different things with it every year. Some years we have a conference. Each year we have webinars. All of those webinars are freely available for you on YouTube to watch. 
Um, here are some of the ones that we're running um, at, for this year, presenting your research was earlier this month. The next one's in October. And then in December, you can register for those. They're all online and they're all free. Um, here, there's the YouTube link to the one on presenting your research that we did in July. And if you go to our events, there's the web link on the bottom there and search for Jolly O'Curry program, you will find the other, um, a bit later in the year, you'll find the other events there as well. And you can register for them completely free. So I would encourage you, if you're looking towards an academic career, to do that. Um, we have been running these webinars for a few years now so here are some of the topics of the webinars that are already up there already on YouTube that you can access and there's the link at the bottom to find the playlist um, that will take you to all of those. So I hope that will be interesting and a bit of extra support for those of you who are looking towards an academic career. A little bit more about support from the Royal Society of Chemistry now. If you're a member, that's that's our email address, the careers team address, email at the top of the screen there, rsc.org uh, forward slash careers. Sorry, that's our web, sorry, rewind, that's our website. If you have a look on there, you'll find lots and lots of resources available to you that are freely <coughs> available whether you're a member or not. So it was definitely worth a look. If you are a member, um, do email us, careers at rsc.org if we can help, and we'll be happy to do that. We run career events and consultations. We're having to do them all remotely now, but they are still happening. So do have a look. And if you're a member, take advantage of that. We've got lots of professional development resources and we have we can help you with networking. We've also got a mentoring scheme and we can provide one-to-one -one guidance in person and by telephone, email, Skype or Zoom, you know, whatever, whatever works for you. All those services are still running now. So if you are a member, do get in touch. And if you'd like to join, there's a, a link there at the bottom of the screen. Um, there's lots and lots of advantages to belonging. And I'm sure, um, you know, people, it, it, you know, local RSC local sections and people like Rajesh who's on the call today can help you with that if you want to. So um, that's all I have to say, actually. I know it's been quite a lot and I've given you a lot to think about, but I do hope it's been helpful for you. Um, if you've got a little bit more time now because of the whole lockdown situation, now might be the time to really um, think about your own professional development, think about your career journey and take those first steps. So I hope it has been of some use to you. I think there was going to be uh, there was going to be a chance for people to ask questions now. I, I don't quite know how that is going to work, um, but I'm happy to take oh. questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful and insightful uh, talk. There were so many important points, and it's difficult to pick just you know few from them. But uh, I would like to mention that I think the CV part, wherein you have mentioned, uh, if explained how to organize your CV from an academic CV to industrial CV and so many points that you mentioned under that I think those were very useful and especially I think for the young uh, uh, participants who are just you know going to begin the career and or who are going to who are in the beginning of the career journey I think uh, this uh, ha has been a very relevant and important uh, talk for them and uh, yes so we have so many questions and there are so many comments also uh, complimenting your lecture, ma'am. Uh, they are saying oh, that. Uh, I'm so glad it's been helpful. Yeah, I, and I would yes. say, you know, do go on to our website www.rsc.org forward slash careers. It doesn't matter whether you're a member or not. You can find lots of information on there about CVs. You know, I agree that that is a very important thing. There's lots of information on there. There's links to other webinars that might help you. So you don't have to be a member. Just just go on there and see see what there is that could be useful for you. Yes, ma'am. I think that's a great opportunity for any person who are interested and who wants to know more about uh, the ROC and then uh, the, all the ROC activities. I think it's a great uh, job that you all are doing. Uh, so thank you so much, ma'am. And I think the questions uh, that are coming, uh, maybe I will only put forward those questions to you on behalf of all the participants. That because would be I'm just worried. Uh, I'm just worried that if we allow them to speak, then there will be too much, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, that, I think and, that's you know, <laughs> Things may go out. <laughs> I, I agree. I uh, think that's a great idea. Yes. Yeah. So I will. Uh, I think pick uh, just four or five questions. Yeah. Uh, so the first question uh, I would like to ask, uh, this is from uh, Mr. G. Vijay Chitra, uh, who is asking, yeah, the question is, 
uh, what skills apart from the technical ones do you think is lacking in freshers that come for job interviews nowadays? So I think uh, this question is uh, if you have conducted any interview and uh, you feel that uh, there is something uh, lacking among the freshers. So uh, they're asking apart from the technical ones. So what do you think is lacking in freshers that come for job interviews? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, yes. I mean, I have done. You know, I've done interviewing myself. You know, to to um, uh, recruit people into the RSC and other organisations. And um, I, th I think, um, like, I, I've got, I'll come back to this whole idea of enthusiasm. You can always tell when somebody is enthusiastic and really wants the job. That comes across so well. I mean, I'm not saying that everybody is a is a real extrovert. You know, we don't expect you to dance on the table and tell us how wonderful we are. That's not the thing. But you. You can tell um, if a person really, really wants the job by the way they've researched the job, they've researched the organisation. One of the hardest questions to answer, and some of the worst answers I've ever heard, are when you say to people, why do you want to work for us? <laughs> there are some terrible answers to that question, you know, so it's likely to be one of the first questions that you will be asked. So the more research you've done into the company, the more you've looked at their history, if it's an industrial company, look at their products, um, be able to talk about that. If you can talk about how that's affected you personally, even better. Um, but I would say enthusiasm, really know why you want to work for the company and really be able to bring real examples into an interview so it's not just about technicalities you're quite right they might ask you um you know give us an example of when you've worked in a team they're expecting you use that star model you know to tell them that. and they're not interested in the chemistry that was going on they want to know about how the team worked together and what your role in that team was and they're also looking for self-awareness, you know, so if you were the person, if they ask you a question and they say, tell us about a time when something went wrong, you know, if you were the person who realised that things were going wrong and did something to, to change that, that shows real self-awareness and real motivation on your part. So it's your personal qualities that they're looking for as well as your chemistry. Thank you, ma'am. I think that was a very important tip. Uh, I guess that is the first thing that one should, you know, keep in mind when they... Uh, yeah, it's absolutely true. I've, I've seen people ask that question and really not be able Can I please request all the other participants to please mute your mics? Uh, we are having a lot of disturbances here. It's a humble request. <laughs> Hello. Okay. We'll carry on regardless. Yeah, okay. So uh, the next question, uh, this is from uh, Mr. Azim Khan. He is asking, ma'am, can we mention skills that we learned ourselves but have no certificate to show to it? Yes, yes, you can. Um, the best thing to do with that is to have some real examples of that. So it might be that in your social life or maybe you do voluntary work, which means you are using skills which you don't get the opportunity to use in, in the lab, for example, um, but they show the kind of person that you are. So if, for example, you do voluntary work, community work, that sort of thing, log all the skills that you're, you're using and then use them as examples. You don't have to have a certificate that says, if you can say, well, I belong to my local group that helps out elderly people in the neighborhood and this is what we do. You know, that shows that you're the kind of person who is aware of the needs of others, that you are prepared, you're self-motivated. That's a great opportunity to show self-motivation. Nobody told you to do this. You got up and did it yourself. It shows personal organization. If you organize things, you know, if, if, if you organize a network or organize a social club or something like that, that shows your ability to organize people, to influence people, to take control of the situation. Log all of those things in your professional development record that I'm encouraging you to keep. Because I like to say to people that, you know, your skills don't just belong to your work. Your, all the skills, everything that you do on a daily basis, all the skills that you use, they don't belong to the task that you were doing at the time, they belong to you. So if you can show personal organisation and leadership in your personal life by leading a group or a sports team or something like that, then that's a quality that you have, you can use that in your work too.
I hope that helps. Sorry. Yes, yes, I have muted myself actually. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this uh, next question is from Miss Pooja Unyal. She is asking telling the interviewer that you have good leadership skills uh, will be a plus point or a negative point? I think it's quite obvious, but I would like you to yeah. uh, answer that. <laughs> It's, it's never going to do any harm um, and I would say it, it's a good thing but you, you have to be very sensitive to what the employer is actually asking for, okay? So if the employer has asked for, um, you know, someone who is self-motivated and can work in a team, make sure you answer that question first. You, you, can, you can talk about situations where you've taken a leadership role in your social life or you know as part of the outside activities that you do but and if it's a leadership role you're going to need to say more about that do you understand what i mean so really what you're doing is you're responding to what the employer is asking for it's never going to do any harm to tell them that you've got evidence of leadership skills but don't 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 go overboard on that if the role is not asking for that you can bring it in as an additional skill something else that they will get by employing you but don't let it overshadow maybe other things that they're asking for. I hope that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. It makes so much sense. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so I think I will take uh, one last question. Uh, this is also from the same uh, person, Ms. Pooja Onyal. Uh, she's asking, at this time of uh, pandemic, many of the people are learning some new skills online. Yes. So will this be added to our CV and how will it affect our profile? Yes, I would say definitely. We are finding, certainly in the UK, a lot of our members that I've been talking to here have been doing exactly the same thing. It's an opportunity for people to think, OK, there's lots of things I can't do at the moment, but positive people, such as the person asking the question, are using the time to build up new skills and different skills. Yes, I can say, you know, if it's a professional course that you're doing, um, it doesn't have to be science related. If you've done, um, you know, something else, you know, an organize a, a management skills course or, you know, anything like that that you've done, if it's professionally related, then yes, that can go on your CV. And yes, you can point to that. You can give that, um, you can give that prominence if it's a kind of skill that the employer is looking for. So if you've taken it upon yourself to learn something new during this situation, I think that will definitely be a point in your favour. We do know that some employers now are actually asking people, it's become an interview question, how have you stayed motivated during the pandemic, during lockdown? So they want to know what people have been doing. And I guess if you if you tell them that you've been sitting there watching TV all the time, it's not going to be too impressive. But if you can say, like the questioner, that you've taken some online courses, that you have looked at your own skills profile, you've got your professional development up to date, you've attended some webinars, you've attended a talk like this, you know, all of those sorts of things, log them all. Because then when you get asked that question, that interview, you will have some good answers. And I would say, on the same subject, that is going to be a good question for you to ask a potential employer during an interview. Um, you know, how have you looked after your staff? How have you looked after your people during the pandemic? You know, it cut, that one cuts both ways, I would say. But yes, anything that you've done to improve your professional skills during the pandemic should definitely go on your CV and you can definitely use it as evidence. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, for so patiently answering all the questions. Uh, I would like to just uh, share with you that, yes, we are uh, really receiving a lot of compliments and uh, people are saying that, uh, the participants are saying that it was such an amazing uh, talk. Somebody is even uh, mentioning that although there were so much noises and disturbances, but it was truly inspiring. So, <laughs> oh, I hope man, absolutely. Desire, thank you so much, ma'am, once again. And uh, on behalf of my director, Dr. Sastri, I would like to thank you once again, ma'am, uh, for taking the time out to be with us today and for delivering such an important and relevant topic under this uh, platform. So, it was entirely now, my pleasure, entirely my pleasure. I've really enjoyed it and I'm very, very grateful to all of you for listening and certainly to, to you organisers for inviting me. It's been, a, it's, it's been completely my pleasure. And if you are an RSC member, there's our, our um, email address at the bottom of the screen there. Do drop us an email. We love to hear from you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. In fact, I would like to tell you that you are the first speaker 
uh, you know, uh, you know, we have uh, had under this platform from outside India. And I would like to thank Rajesh sir also for connecting us with you. Uh, so Rajesh sir, uh, do you want to uh, say something? Do you have any remarks to make? No, I think uh, I would like to thank Julie Pan for sparing some time and giving a wonderful lecture here. I think it was very insightful for the young students who are entering into the field. And I think it kind of gives a better perspective in terms of writing series as well as how do we really go for the jobs in India. I know there's a currently market is not right, but in terms of what we are seeing at the current pandemic, but this kind of gives a lovely uh, insight into how to approach the job market as you, as it can go open. So. And finally, I'd like to thank CSIR and especially Dr. Shastri and Nilka who have been quite supportive of us in terms of organizing this lecture. Uh, uh, and uh, and for the opportunity to for the RSC to take forward this partnership as well. And we it actually be the other way around, sir. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I hope uh, we would be uh, seeing you soon with another few interesting lectures from the scientists over the next two weeks. And I think that should be a much more interesting. Um, uh, we have our CEO uh, Helen Payne going to talk about her journey as a woman chemist. We have a person from industry, uh, our former president Dominic Tisley, who will be talking from industry academia partnership, who is from industry. And I would like to see more people coming and joining those as well, come again for these lectures as well. Yes, sir. In the coming uh, weeks, we have more interesting talks and uh, we'll be having a more number of people participating. So, thank you so much, sir, for that. And uh, I would like to thank our speaker again. Yeah. Yes. So uh, before we uh, close the session, so ma'am, do we have your permission now to close the session? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad everybody's enjoyed. I, I'm Thank sorry. You so I much. We all, they have all enjoyed, ma'am. <laughs> and uh, to give uh, the word of thanks formally, I would like to request my colleague, Dr. Lucky Saikya. He's a senior scientist from CSIR NIST. Dr. Lucky. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone from India and Google. good evening, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Julie. Good morning. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, my you know honor and proud privilege to offer formal uh, word of thanks. Uh, you know, uh, you have touched upon so many things. You know, starting from the uh, three very important qualities to develop in the process of career, like flexibility, uh, agility, and uh, resilience. And then you have touched upon that you know career is not only you know getting a job. This career is a lifelong uh, learning journey. Then you know how to find opportunities and what what it is important for academia as well as for industry and how to you know make CV for particularly uh, uh, for say industry as well as for a, a, you know, any academic job. And what the CV should exactly is, you know speak about. So this you know SOP or, or the letter which is uh, the why you know uh, you, someone is applying for the particular you know, job or particular position and how to write the academic CV uh, then how to appear for the you know industrial uh, interviews mm -hmm. as well as academic interview and the, the most important thing what I like to mention that I like that you know star model situation task action result and the most important what we have learned during the process so this is quite important and you know uh, then you know forming the uh, uh, how to build a network uh, what are the different ways either by conference seminar events or different you know uh, social media platforms so these are quite important for the uh, you know young people as well as you know people like me and uh, uh, so thank you very much for this uh, very informative and wonderful lecture. And there, you know, as Ilika has rightly mentioned, there are a lot of uh, uh, appreciative messages we have received, you know, uh, throughout the country. And uh, definitely, it's uh, you know worth listening to, to your lecture, and we are looking forward uh, for. You know, many more lectures from Royal Society. You know, uh, thank you once again. Uh, you know, from uh, uh, you know my part as well as on behalf of our honourable director, the Kazian Sastri, and the whole team of uh, summer research training program. 
organized by CSIR and EIST. Then I must thank Dr. Rajesh Purishwar, this uh, you know, head of uh, uh, Royal Society in India, for connecting us with the uh, Royal Society team and uh, making this uh, you know, lecture possible. Thank you, uh, uh, Rajesh, for you know, uh, this wonderful uh, opportunity you have created for us. Uh, really, you know, it's uh, possible only because of you. And thank you, uh, everyone. You know, there are a lot of people who are involving in this technical and uh, you know, publicity purpose and all. So thank you, everyone. And thanks for the participants for joining with us today. And once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Julie. Uh, you are very welcome. From India. Yeah, you are you. very welcome. It was my pleasure. <laughs> Over thank you, ma'am. And stay safe. And all of you, stay safe too. It's been lovely to talk to you. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye.